So hello everyone and welcome to this Genetic Alliance webinar. My name is Amelia Chappelle and I'm Genetics Resources and Services Specialist at Genetic Alliance. Today's webinar is called Suffering from Information Overload, No One to Trust It or Trash It. So this webinar, um, as Tam has already mentioned, is going to be a little bit different from our usual webinars and that we'd like it to be interactive and we would love to hear from people on the line. Um, so usually we have participants muted during the webinar so you can't um, speak, can't hear anything from your phone. But today, um, if you type in your audio pin code, you'll be able to talk on the line too. So it's sort of like more like a conference call. Um, to help me with the discussion today is Melissa March from Innovation Network which is a nonprofit evaluation and consulting firm in Washington, D.C. Um, Genetic Alliance has been working with Innovation Network to evaluate the online tool that we'll be talking about today, which is called the Trust It or Trash It tool. And we'll take a look at that once we get started. So again, because this is an open call, just as a reminder, um, to join the webinar, you need to both log in on your computer using the link that was emailed to you when you registered but you also need to call in with a phone in order to be able to speak on the webinar. And each person has a unique audio PIN number that um, shows up on the webinar panel when you join. <clears throat> um, when you're not speaking, if you could please keep your phone on mute by dialing star six, just so we don't get a lot of feedback and extra noises on the call. Um, and to unmute, you just push star six again. As usual with our webinars, you can also submit questions or comments by typing them in to the webinar panel that shows up on your screen. So, you know, even if you're talking and if you're having, say, a technical difficulty that you don't want to say to everybody, you can just type it into the webinar panel and um, we'll get back to you by typing back. Um, lastly, the session will be recorded just like all of our webinars and it will be available for streaming and download um, next week. And at the end of the webinar, when you close out of the webinar software, there will be a survey that pops up, and we would really appreciate it if you could fill out that survey at the end of the webinar. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this first slide is showing just some comparisons between how information was organized in the past and how inf we can now access information. And this was really interesting to me. Um, just I, I guess I never really thought about it this, this way before, but we used to operate um, in, in a world of information scarcity. So only certain people could um, have information printed, written down, and the goal was to get all of the information that you could possibly get on a certain topic. Now we're sort of operating in, a, in an information overload state um, where a lot of people can um, create information with, obviously with um, the internet, that helps a lot, websites, blogs. Um, there's also cheaper printing, more printing options. Um, people get information from things, sites like Facebook. Um, so so it's not so much that we're in a, in a world where um, you necessarily want to look for every piece of information um, because there's a lot out, out there. So then the second bullet in the then category is that information is power. And it, uh, um, this phrase, in the know, you know, if you have the information, um, you're in a position of power. And then there's people that don't have the information. Whereas now, um, it's easier. You know, these are obviously vast generalizations, but it is easier for um, people to have access to the same types of information. Obviously not in all cases, but um, the job is really in finding the information you want, um, figuring out how to sort it, then figuring out how to evaluate that information and how to use it. So um, that, that's a pretty different model there. And then the last point, restricted creation and dissemination of information in the then category is related to that information scarcity. Um, you know, before the um, computer and internet age when there were a lot of people publishing information, um, obviously the dissemination of that information was much um, more limited. 
And now, um, you know, almost anyone can publish something. You can make a website. You can blog. Um, there are even cheaper ways to, you know, disseminate pamphlets and things like that than there were before. And the first website we're going to look at is the Trust It or Trash It tool. Um, and this is a tool that Genetic Alliance um, made as part of a five-year project funded by the CDC. The URL is www.trustortrash.org. Um, so feel free to log into this website as we talk if you'd like to kind of play around with it or walk through it. Um, and let me show you really quick. We also have a developer version of this website. So this is trustortrash.org forward slash developer. This website is more for people developing information or for people who really want to evaluate a piece of information in great detail. So we'll take a um, good look at the um, sort of quick evaluator, trustortrash.org, but I just wanted to show you this one because um, people that create their own information either for um, their organization, like newsletters or um, website content, they find that this version, the developer version, um, is more helpful to them because they really want, they don't want a quick overview of how to evaluate something. Um, for the purposes of producing your own information, you really want to make sure um, sort of all your ducks are in a row. So, um, you know, each of these scales has a lot of information in it. Um, things that you can include. Um, this is acting sort of as an idea generator for things to include in your publication. <clears throat> the quality scale is largely what the um, quicker evaluation version of Trust or Trash is based on. So these types of things to evaluate, but there's more information in this version. So if um, you know if you're using just this Trust or Trash org and you want more information, you can always go to this version. We'll go back to trustortrash.org, um, and I'll just show you the about page. So as I said, this is a tool that we developed with um, a grant from the CDC, and we had many project partners, and they're listed here. Um, so you know, we have condition-specific advocacy organizations. Um, Niche Peg, uh, National Council of La Raza helped us translate this tool into Spanish, so it is available in Spanish, um, both this version and the developer version, um, and University of Maryland School of Medicine. So let's take a look um, at this tool. This is the main page that you get to when you type in trustortrash.org. Um, as you can see here, it's this is not. This is a tool that's not limited to evaluating information on websites, but you can also use it to look at handouts, <clears throat> booklets, brochures, um, you know, videos. It can. It's really meant to help you think critically about the information that you are coming to. So today we'll look at some websites, but just keep in mind that it's really not limited just to websites. And then here in this bottom panel we have where you can send us a note about questions. Um, you can print out a version of all of the content that's on this web page. Um, you can, this is a link to the developer version. And then this is a survey to provide us feedback on the tool. So if we go into who said it, there's kind of, there's three main topics here. Who wrote it? Who provided the facts, or where did the facts come from, and who paid for it? So when we were making this tool, we, we didn't want to have sort of a checklist saying that, you know, if you can find this piece of information, definitely trust it, or definitely don't use it. We didn't want to do that. Again, this is a critical thinking tool. So here are some things about who wrote it. Think about trusting it if the author's name is easy to find if um, you know that they have experience with the condition or whatever topic you're looking into, if they're respected in the community and by their colleagues. Think about not trusting that information if you don't know who wrote it or you can't find the author's name, if you can't find any information about the background or experience, the expertise of the author. 
So who provided the facts? If the sources are listed, that's always a good thing. Um, there's sort of a caveat here that even if the sources are listed, um, you know, it obviously depends on what those sources are. Um, but it's an automatic red flag if there are no sources anywhere. And then who paid for it? If the, if the sponsor has a lot of experience with the condition and the information isn't you know, hitting you over the head with trying to get you to buy something, um, that's usually a good thing. If um, the sources are, are not related to the content or clearly appear to be selling something, that's obviously a bias. Um, or if there's no information about the funding or sponsoring group. So now we'll click on when did they say it. And this is basically, can you tell when the information was written or updated? Um, so obviously that's the trust it. The, the um, sort of red flags are if the information seems to be out of date based on other things that you know, or if there's no date. Um, we should really all be putting dates on, or at least updated on, things that we've created to help people um, you know, decide how up to date this information is. And then the how did you know question is, is, it, is the medical information based on um, you know, large research studies, or is it only based on someone's opinion or individual experience? Now again, just because information is only based on one person's experience doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. It's just something to think about. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't make all of your decisions based on one, one person's experience. And then does the information seem reasonable based on what you've read or know? So um, if the information matches what you found in multiple other sources, um, the, this one is interesting because we had kind of a hard time when we were developing this because sometimes information that's new could be new, good, cutting edge research. But it could also be um, just wrong <laughs> if it doesn't match with everything else. So this is, this especially is really an area um, to think critically about something and, um, you know, if the, if the information that you found doesn't match anything else, it may be a good idea to talk with other experts about that. And then all through the tool, if you want to get to the developer version, the more in-depth version, you can click on this to dig deeper for more information. So um, let's go ahead and look at a couple websites. Um, can people, are people able to speak on the phone? I haven't heard anyone yet. Yeah, everybody. It's Kendall Bergman, I can speak. Okay. But I've got my phone muted. Great. I guess um, that's exactly what we asked you to do, so thanks. <laughs> um, so I would encourage people to unmute your phones now, um, and we can just have a discussion about some of these websites. I randomly picked a couple, and then um, some people sent in websites for us to look at. So the first um, person that sent us a website is this um, Potter Willie Syndrome Association website. So I went to the medical page and um, just, you know, with those sort of core um, things in the Trusted or Treasure tool, who is the author? Can we tell who wrote this? Um, well, obviously this information was put out by the Potter Willie Syndrome Association. Um, I don't exactly know who wrote this these, the specific information on the page, um, but it does say here at the bottom that this physician, who's the chairperson of the Scientific Advisory Board, reviewed and edited this website. Um, so to me, that helped me trust the information on the website because they, you know, they re came right out and said who has reviewed this. Um, and then I looked for a while, but I did find this where it says it was edited last, and um, the state is in 2011. So um, that's kind of a, another thing to look for is when was this written or updated. Um, so let's go back here and see what else. So we, we went through who said it. Um, you know, there's a couple things to think about in this area. We know we know the organization that wrote it. We don't exactly know the person who wrote it. 
um, who provided the facts or where did the facts come from. We know the person who reviewed the information. Um, I don't see references here, but all of these bits of information are hyperlinks. So it's possible that, that there's, I mean, it's obvious that there's more information as you dig down deeper. And again, this is just looking at one of the pages. So um, if you really wanted to thoroughly evaluate this, you'd probably be looking at multiple pages. But just so um, we can go kind of quickly through this, I was just looking at one. Amelia. Um, does, oops, Amelia. Does anyone else on the line have sort of reactions so far? Amelia, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Amelia, this is Elder Riley. Can you hear me? Hi. Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Um, how does the tool handle things like the Han Code of Ethics and things like that? Does it give any credence to other certifications for websites? Mm -hmm. No. You know, we didn't get into specific certifications in the tool. Okay. Um, I, you know, we tried hard not to kind of give stamps of approval for things um, and keep it more as a critical thinking tool for people just because there are so different, so many different types of kind of approval or, um, you know, codes for things that we just didn't want to get into those specifics. Also because, you know, even if things are, you know, sort of, have the, a good housekeeping seal of approval from something. It, people's um, situations change, I think, and um, you know, people look for information for different reasons and at different times and different types of information. And so we really kept this tool as a um, a critical thinking guide, I guess. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have um, reactions about how? they would kind of use information in the tool to look at a website like this. All right, well, we'll we will um, just go ahead and move on. This is another website I pulled up. Um, it, it's clearly selling something. <laughs> um, but there's all this sort of hubbub right now about pomegranate juice and is it healthy for you or is it a total crock? <laughs> um, so I pulled up this website thinking that we could use the tool to look at it. Um, so if we go again to the first thing on the tool, who wrote it, who provided the facts, who paid for it? So it's this palmhealth.com. Um, looking through here, I didn't, I didn't see any one who wrote this information or who um, edited it. Um, so that's kind of one one red flag. The other that's just super obvious is that they're clearly selling a product. So the information that they're providing may be skewed to make you want to buy their product. Um, Oh, the where, where did the facts come from is interesting on this website because, so this is their main page, but then they have a link to scientific studies. So they list a whole bunch of um, references here. So these are all um, papers and they say that they all come from PubMed. Um, I have no idea what these papers say, or if they just mentioned pomegranate juice <laughs> somewhere in here. Um, but as you can see, it's, they've listed an extensive list of studies. So, um, you know, on, on one hand, it's a, it's a great thing. They listed all of the studies that have to do with this, but they're not specific. They don't tie back to the, to the information in um, on their home page, so I don't know exactly what they're referencing. So I suppose if you're really interested in buying this or learning more about this, you could go back and look up those um, references. So when did they say it? Um, I didn't see a date anywhere on any of their information. They, they have a copyright, but that's not 
not the same thing as the date of when the information was created. So that's kind of a red flag there. Um, and then the how did they know? Um, I don't really know anything about the health benefits of pomegranate juice. So I don't. Um, I wouldn't be the one to be comparing it with what's, what else I know. But I guess you could look at other sources um, for pomegranate health. But this is just a, sort of a, a silly example, I guess, um, of what's out there on the internet um, and how you can use the tools to sort of help you think critically. Of course, sites like this or any site we go to, we have a gut reaction to it. Um, just based on our own past experiences. And my gut reaction to this was, there, you're selling me something. Um, my gut reaction to this is, it's an advocacy organization, um, which obviously has its own um, biases and angles and slants. Um, but, you know, I, w I would trust more that they know about their condition. Um, and then, it, you know, then as I'm reading it, again, it makes me feel good that there's this person who's reviewed the information. There's uh, phone numbers all over the place that also you can contact them, which um, just as another thing, you know, they're kind of open and transparent with the information that they're providing. Um, so before I move on, does anyone have reactions to either of these websites or using the tool with these websites? So lastly, another person wrote in and was asking about Wikipedia, which a lot of people um, you know, ask about Wikipedia. And there have been a number of studies over the past um, mostly six years about the accuracy of Wikipedia. And um, most of the studies have said that it's actually fairly accurate. Um, the one thing about Wikipedia is that we go, as we go through the trusted or trash it tool, the first thing is the author. And in Wikipedia, the, the whole idea is that it's built on many, 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 many authors. So you, you can't immediately tie um, you know, the credentials or the experience of an author to the whole of the, the text. I would say that's the biggest um, sort of, not red flag, but like caveat to Wikipedia. Um, the studies about Wikipedia has also shown, have also shown that um, most of the inaccuracies are due to omission. So it just means people haven't written on certain topics yet um, or about certain parts of certain topics. Um, but as we can see, that, so there are references throughout this. Um, you know, it's not like a peer-reviewed re journal where, where people check these references. Um, so people are putting these in these references, and then it's sort of up to the other users of Wikipedia pages to, to hold them to a standard. So it very well could be that people put in information and references, but they're not actually, you know, they may not actually be the best references and things like that. Um, but you can see here's the list of references. Um, you can also see when the page was last modified, down to the minute, actually. Um, and if you go into Wikipedia, if you, I think you have to um, log in and create an account. But if you want to look at a certain page, um, and when you edit things, you can actually see who wrote what. Um, so what person was tied to what information. Um, chances are you're not going to know anything about that person because, um, you know, people don't put in their name, their credentials, their institution, their their background, where they're coming from. You know, it's just their name. So, so again, there's a lot of questions about Wikipedia. Um, I think the biggest um, sort of thing to think about is that author source. And because Wikipedia is created for many users to contribute, the pages that are on more popular topics are more accurate because more people create um, edit the inaccuracies out quicker um, than topics on Wikipedia that are more esoteric or there's just not a lot of people writing on them. So um, any any discussion or questions about Wikipedia or, or how that relates? Um, 
All right. Um, well, why don't I turn it over to Melissa? Melissa's going to um, sort of guide some discussion and ask questions and um, get some feedback from all of us. So if everyone could unmute their phone if they're not in a super loud place. Um, and Melissa, why don't you go ahead and um, get started with some discussion questions. Okay, thank you, Amelia. Um, thanks um, again for everyone for your time today and thinking around the Trusted or Trashy tool. And so as Amelia said, we're just going to take the next 10 or 15 minutes to hear from you and get your feedback about your impressions of the tool. And so for Genetic Alliance, it's going to be um, extremely helpful if we can get your candid feedback today um, so that they can actually roll out the tool to the network. And um, in addition to our discussion today, you, there will be a very short survey at the end of this webinar to capture any additional information that you have not been able to share um, during this webinar. So if there aren't any questions, then we'll just get going. So prior to today, to today had you heard of the Trusted or Trash It tool? Anyone who's on the line? Yes, this is have. Kendall Bergman from Susan G. Cohen for the Cure, and no, I had not, I had not heard of the tool. Okay. Elder Riley from Research Advocacy Network. Yes, I had. Okay. And um, Elder, what exactly have you just heard of it, or have you actually used it to um, help evaluate things or to create resources? I haven't used the tool, but it, I did know of it because of a presentation by Sharon Terry. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, this is Joyce Bailey calling from uh, New England Newborn Screening Program. <clears throat> and I've heard of this uh, Trust or Trash it from um, being on the Newborn Screening Clearinghouse um, Advisory Board. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And so what were your impressions of um, the Trusted or Trash It tool? It's very, it's excellent. I was wondering if it would be possible, though, if you could have examples on the website. I don't know if that would, how that would work, but sort of like the example yeah. you gave us. Um, there, I, we I actually have, Do you? we have examples in, in this version, in the developer version. So let, let me see if I can find some here. Actually, oh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Melissa, do you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, let me see. It's taking a bit to load. So there are examples in the developer version. Um, as you can see here. So this is about the source of information. Mm -hmm. And then there's links to, you know, points to consider. So information put out by government agencies, how to think about that. Information put out by parent-sponsored groups, how to think about that. And then university or academic groups. So there, there's a lot more information in the developer version. Um, so I would say if you're if you're yearning for examples or more or more information, I would go to that version. We tried to keep this version um, as clean as possible, like as little a little text as possible. Um, but you know that's really good feedback. If you think that the examples really make these points, um, you know, if they're necessary. To think of these points, and that you know, that's something that we can incorporate. Okay, thank you. Um, just to get more specific, how about the design and layout of the trusted or trusted tool? What are your impressions of how the website um, looks, and and so on? This is Elder Riley. Um, I like the the nice, clean design, and it's very much in keeping with your genetic alliance look. <laughs> uh, I wonder if it would be possible, and it might improve the tool a little bit, if it could lay on top of whatever website you're, you're looking at, so you don't have to go back and forth. 
Yeah, um, it is possible, actually. <laughs> um, so we've created a widget of this tool. Okay, good. Let me that see. Well, okay. Yeah, let me see um, if I can pull. Oh, my computer's not cooperating. But um, so the thing is with the widget that you have to um, put, actually program it into your site. And, it, and what it does is it opens up the tool on the bottom of your web page so you can scroll through material on a page while the tool is um, on the bottom and you can actually click through everything. Um, so the thing is it has to be, the owner of that website has to program it into the page. So, Okay, so the like, person's evaluating. Exactly, so, so we have it, Genetic Alliance has it on some pages so that people can, like we have it on our policy page, um, so people can evaluate where we got the information. Um, but you're right, it's, it's not, as it is now, it's not programmed so that like, you could take it and float it on top of another page. Mm -hmm. um, you have to go back and that, That's great feedback, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But it's something to think about um, when we're reviewing or developing our own web pages to include the widget. Yeah, That's definitely. Great. Yeah. And if yeah. and if anyone um, is interested in doing so, you can um, contact me. Okay. Any final thoughts of your impressions of the tool, whether the design, the layout, or even the potential value of the tool? Um, well, this, this is Joanne. This is Lisa Chismark from Clemson University, and um, we actually I uh, teach in the School of Nursing, and I'm going to incorporate this into um, one of my classes because we already do a um, whole week of evaluating a website. So, you know, I'm okay. I see a pretty good tool for that. Right. Oh, that's great news. Yeah, we've heard, so just an interesting um, side note, I guess, this, you know, we developed this thinking about rare genetic conditions. As we created it, it expanded to any health condition. But we found that people, because we track, um, you know, who's linking to the tool online and stuff, we found that there's a whole group of people that use this tool um, from the home shopping network, <laughs> like for, to evaluate what they want to buy, I guess. Um, <laughs> you know, who's selling it, what's the what's the person's background, things like that. So. You know, it can be used for many, many different things. Um, that was a complete surprise to us, but <laughs> I, I, it was all over their message boards. Um, but so, it, again, you know, it, it, education is a great example um, for pretty much anyone in school should be able to learn how to think critically about the information that they're including, like in papers or citing, um, but that it does not need to be specific to genetic conditions. Um, specifically. Right. Thanks, Amelia. That's a good um, segue into the next question, which has to do with whether or not you ever find yourself wanting something like the Trash It or Trash It tool while searching for information online, especially health information. Um, I'll, I'll go again. Uh, this is Lisa again from Clemson University, because I teach healthcare genetics and applied healthcare genetics in the School of Nursing which is kind of like an emerging uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. And through, uh, so I spend hours and hours looking at websites uh, to link for my students to look at and being able to evaluate them. I mean, this is going to help me uh, mm -hmm. tremendously, ones to even include. Um, so I, you know, I see it saving me quite a bit of time once I've actually gone in there and looked at, mm -hmm. at the tools. Right. Great. This is Kendall Bergman. This is Kendall Bergman at Susan G. Komen for the Cure. And working with our research advocates, this is definitely a tool that is needed. Um, just on a, I would say for some of the advocates that just kind of have different news feeds coming into their email, um, it's needed all kind of all the time. So it's valuable. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. This is Joanne Salcedo with Dickey Biotech, and am I heard? Yes. Yep. 
Oh, quick question. Um, this is brand new to me, so I learned about it just by getting familiar recently with Genetic Alliance. And I'm in keeping with your idea to steer away from giving stamps of approval. Is there a way, however, that we can tap into other people who might have checked out the website and, you know, sort of see while they found this was their impression of the source or the resources or um, sort of a catalog of websites that have been evaluated by people. And then you have to maybe critically think of their evaluation, but um, right. they could say, yeah, we looked forever. It took us an hour to find when this was last edited, but it is shown on such and such page. It would also help website developers become a whole lot more accountable for what they do put out there. But I'm wondering if you intend to do that, if there is that. Um, Short answer, no. <laughs> um, I, but I think you know this this grant is actually finished, so the grant was kind of creating the tool and, dis, and now disseminating it. Um, but I, I don't see anything wrong with saying, you know, as you create resources, this resource was created um, using the Trust or Trash It tool um, mm -hmm. and a link to it. You know, I think that'd be great because then you're sort of, you know, you're using all of these steps, um, you know, in the developer version especially, which is much more in-depth, to actually create your materials, and then you're saying, you know, hey, if you have any questions, go back and evaluate it yourself. I uh, you mm -hmm. sort of like we stand behind the information that we're putting out there. So, you know, I think that would be great if people did that too. We actually had um, uh, Chris Voki from PXE International. Um, she worked with us to present uh, on this tool. She didn't work in developing it, but she used it just sort of like as a test case for their um, newsletter. And she spent a long time and went through their um, quarterly newsletter and went through the developer version of the tool. And she actually made a lot of changes um, just based on things that um, weren't front of mind for her. Um, you know, she put, I think, you know, they had the date on it, but they didn't have um, who exactly had written every section of the of the newsletter that had more, like, medical or scientific information. Um, this part, let's see, in the developer version, this third part is a usability scale, which is a a made-up word that we made. <laughs> um, but it's basically how you're presenting information to your audience and things to think about. So she made a lot of changes based on this section for their newsletter um, about how they develop some of the material actually on their website as well, um, using specific terms. And each of these are hyperlinks with more information. Um, you know, how, how you consider the reading level, how, how you present the material with organizing it um, as far as making bullets and keeping white space and how sentences are formatted. Um, so after they did that, um, I think they, they put on it, you know, created using the Trusted or Trash It tool and then a link to it. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Um, I'd actually be curious to hear um, from everyone, what's, what's your current process for kind of evaluating and assessing the information that you find? Or if you're even developing information, what's the current process or um, approach that you use? This is Kendall Bergman again with Susan G. Cohen for The Cure, and um, I always check in with our um, education team. They, we have a contract with um, Harvard Medical School, and um, so for the scientific information specifically, um, that's always my go-to is one of my right. colleagues mm -hmm. and or our scientific leadership. But, but I would say there hasn't really been a, a process in place and to know that this tool is available, again, is is very helpful. Right. Thank you. This is Elder Reddy with Research Advocacy Network. When we develop um, educational materials, especially our print materials, 
we use a combined review process that we involve advocates or the target audience and, of course, our medical reviewers as well. And many times we do focus groups or content message testing along the way. Okay. Okay. That's a um, great point, to, you know, to involve, involve the, the people that you're actually writing the information for um, from the beginning. When we um, started out creating the developer version of the tool, you know, we had in there sort of, you know, involve, involve your audience that you're writing this for, but it was more general. And the advocacy groups we were working with really helped us understand that it's not only important to involve them, but it's important to involve people from the very get-go of when you're creating information, not just sort of like at the end as final reviewers. Um, yeah, at the end, it's way too late. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I have multiple examples of when it's changed the content tremendously. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Save you probably time and money, too. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else with any thoughts on that? Okay. So based on what you saw today and how you interact with information in your work or personal life, um, what aspects of the tool do you think will be most valuable to you? What particular aspects of the tool? This is Ellie Mulcahy. I work with the Maine Genetics Program, and I'm also am uh, one of the offices for the New England Regional Genetics Group. Um, mm -hmm. I was <clears throat> introduced to Trust It or Trash It by a colleague who attended the um, NichePeg conference um, probably a year and a half ago. And I've been referring to it a few times related to my work, but the one thing that jumped out at me today is um, although we consult with uh, some consumers, so people from our audience and also uh, professionals, um, our medical consultants, when we develop web-based materials and other information that we would post on our website, um, I don't think we've ever referenced who we've had review the material before. Or potentially, I know for our state website, um, I don't think we've cited all of our sources for the information. We've kind of uh, summarized information and presented it. Um, and I don't know if we've dated things. So this is going to be real helpful. They right. sound like pretty basic ideas, but they're things that we um, haven't necessarily included before. Okay. okay. And I think I'll be using, using the developer's version um, more often in the future. Great. That's a great point, and that, that's sort of what um, Chris from PXC said to us after she spent a lot of time on their newsletter with the developer's version was, you know, I know this stuff. This is not rocket science. Um, it's it's obvious that you should have a date on it and you should say who wrote it and whatever. But you you know, after going through in a in a systematic way, she said that you know the number of changes we ended up making was not insignificant, even though I know this stuff. Um, so that that was interesting feedback for us to hear too. Right. Right. Hey. Any other thoughts on how you use information and how this um, tool might be valuable to you. Okay, so again, Steele from Scotland here, am, am I speaking here? Yes. Yes, yeah, sorry, I appear to have muted myself uh, mistakenly previously. <laughs> uh, with regards to uh, the first place that I would always uh, go to because I'm involved in patient advocacy, uh, generally the first place I would always go to for uh, reliable information would be PubMed, PubMed Central. Uh, thereafter, I would uh, look to websites, that kind of stuff, but uh, as the the example you gave earlier uh, <coughs> with the company that was uh, selling uh, nutrients and a whole list of, of potential uh, abstracts but there was no links uh, to actually look at the information. But I think uh, generally um, with regards to healthcare information, uh, I would probably more trust uh, websites that uh, provided uh, links back to you know, uh, published uh, scientific articles, that kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. Well, having said that, you can get anything published in a journal. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you. 
Okay. Um, and is there any aspect of the tool that is unclear to you and that we can actually discuss further right now? I know it's been a short webinar, but um, any initial thoughts on what might still be unclear? I <clears throat> Again, another point that was mentioned earlier mm -hmm. about uh, folk uh, using, using this uh, facility for something um, or for entities that, as far as I can see, that are not uh, designed <clears throat> for what this uh, is about, maybe to make it a bit more clear that this, this is mainly uh, about uh, medical issues, to try to rule out folk using it for absolutely everything, unless you want that to happen, but as far as I can see, this is purely for for uh, medical patients' uses maybe make that a bit more clear on the front page. Okay. 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 Thank you for that. No problem. Okay. And is there anything that the tool doesn't address that you think would be helpful? Any other um, thoughts on additional things that the tool might might be helpful with, but it doesn't really um, focus on that right now or address that. Or I guess another another way um, to think about that or a, a question related to that is are there things that your um, people in your network or constituents or people you work with come to you or are constantly or consistently asking about that um, you have to always provide the answer or refer to someone else that's not um, here in the tool. All right, well, that's good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So do you think you'd actually share this tool with um, others in your community, your network, um, colleagues and friends? And do you think there are actually certain types of people that would especially benefit from being aware of this tool? Yeah, I would certainly pass on information, definitely. Okay. Yes, yeah. I would share do that. And I do you think people would benefit? Mm -hmm. Do people, does anyone on the line have um, people that they especially would share this with, but other people that they wouldn't, like people in certain situations or certain types of people? So again, this is Kendall Bergman at Susan G. Cohen for the Cure, and I, I would definitely share this with my research advocates. I don't, mm -hmm. uh, I think in, in a case-to-case -case basis, so when I say that, I mean like in a individual conversations, if I'm talking with some of my other colleagues um, and or volunteers who are not necessarily interested in the science, on a day-in, day-out basis, but they have some scientific questions, I would direct them to this, but I wouldn't just share this with them out of context. My research yep. advocates, I would share with them, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm preparing my little email that I send out to them, and I am going to send this send this tool to them today. So, so, so sort of based on, like, their job or position. <laughs> and their level of interest. So the research okay. advocates are all volunteers. They're the common advocates in science. They are automatic. I, I know that they're interested in the science and the research. So I'm going to send this mm -hmm. to them because this is something that I know that they will benefit from. My other colleagues and the other volunteers that I interact with, I would share this with them on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Uh, just a, um, a very general a general comment here. Has there been some uh, relatively new to this uh, website? A few days ago, has there been any discussion about uh, trust it or trash it on social networking sites like Facebook or Twitter and stuff like that? Are you are you asking has it been? Yeah. Um, you know, not that I know of. I haven't seen any um, discussions on this on on social networking sites. Um, you know, that's that's a great point in that you know the social networking sites. Sometimes do or, or blogs or you know whatever. Yeah. Sometimes do get into some medical or health information, um, and I think 
you know, this would be the perfect thing to, you know, write that next comment and put a link to it in the middle of those conversations. Sure. Okay, they, they, am I allowed to release, release a tweet later on about this, or is, that, or, or is it still yeah, under the radar? Yeah, I mean, please distribute this tool however, um, in any way. You can okay. tweet, Facebook, write. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There's actually a share button on the website as yeah, well. Yeah, on the web, what do you think? <coughs> uh, there's no other yeah. uh, comments, uh, say, uh, general comments. Uh, you've got the two categories, uh, uh, trust or trash, uh, with so much information being on the internet, uh, uh, and that's what's only going to continue to grow. Uh, uh, have you thought about uh, a sort of a third category of, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure, or is it a distinct trust or trash, and that's it? I think uh, there, there might be... School. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I mean, they're all really meant to be <laughs> think about trusting it, think yeah. about trashing it, um, not definitively one yeah, category right. or the other. And we thought about doing a trust it, think about it, trash it, but really we decided that you really have to think about all of them. Um, yeah. You know, it, even if you have, but a, you know, they each really should be thought about. Um, and again, you know, information changes, situations change. Um, the, the, the type of thing you're looking at can vary greatly. So we thought in order to keep the tool as applicable to as many things as possible, they're really, they, should, they should all be guides for how to think critically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is Lisa, again, from Clemson University. And um, as the essentials change and, and nursing moves into uh, the DNP programs, uh, they're adding the genetic piece to it. And a lot of nurses, you know, uh, nurse practitioners head towards the Internet to look for uh, sources. And, and we see that, I see that in papers all the time, and that they have cited websites. Um, you know, so I see this as, as another tool uh, to teach them and to just like, instead of just going to Google and, and whipping up a website and then citing it, and saying, okay, well, I've cited it, but is that a, a truly good source to cite? Um, and I also see it, um, my father also is, is quite computer savvy and stuff like that, and, and he has a lot of, um, pulls a lot of stuff off the Internet as far as health information and different things. And, and I even see it at a certain level with uh, some patient care. I know that I'm going to uh, share it with him uh, to have him go back when he's pulling off, uh, he's kind of on a vitamin C kick right now, um, to, to show him how to evaluate websites like that when they come in, you know, because I've had other patients that have come in with stuff they've pulled off the Internet. And um, if the patient population is, is savvy enough, I, you know, I think they also need to be thinking about what they're reading out there. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point and, you know, how... We talked about earlier, you have gut feelings about things, but, um, you know, if your friend is coming to you with these printouts and you have a gut feeling about them one way or another, um, your arguments may not hold water <laughs> one way or the other. But if you, you say, well, is there is there an author? Can you tell what the references are? Do you know where the money came from? You know, things like that. It, it just... You're right. It, it's a it's a more full conversation about that information. Okay. okay. Are there any other um, final comments or thoughts on the tool, or what you saw today, or what you'd like to know more about? Yeah, I think I've said my piece. So I shall leave it to others. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is Joanne hey. Salcedo again. Just a final comment. It's it seems maybe a little off, went off, but um, I'm always surprised now, even at the high school level, when I'm just tutoring a student in freshman biology, and they're, they come across topics that are disease-related, genetics a lot, and they have to write papers. And it's surprising how they're, they have to cite their sources, but they have no, there's no structure around what, what is considered a good source or not. Right. And um, I think, uh, you know, just teachers instructing to, so often they cite sources and they have no clue when it was written or just who wrote it. Just those two basics, I think. This is one-off, but this is very general. 
kids mm-hmm. are already going to the web to cite their papers. And they, they should be sensitive to these kinds of things. I'll bring it up to my tutoring <laughs> students. <laughs> yeah, if, if anyone has ideas how to implement this in the public education system, that'd be good. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually a good, uh, that could be a target. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, well, thank Great. you. Well, Go ahead, Amelia. Thank I'm you, sorry. everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Um, and just so you remember, the URL for this is trustortrash.org. And then the developer version is trustortrash.org forward slash developer. And again, feel free to share this with whoever um, you think would find it helpful. And um, right after you exit this webinar, you, there will be a short survey, I think five or eight questions that will pop up. We really appreciate um, your input. No problem. Um, what was that? Very helpful. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. And special thanks to uh, Melissa and Innovation Network as well. Sure. Thank you, everyone.